The biblical legend of Methuselah tells us the story of a man who lived over 900 years, a life which overlapped with significant events in Earth's past. Methuselah remains a powerful symbol of longevity and has inspired various ideas across theology, literature, and science and medicine. But could we ever reach such a lifespan? My guest today is co-founder of the Methuselah Foundation, which is focused on making 90 the new 50 by the year 2030. Funding audacious projects on Earth and space, they are beginning to transcend science fiction to make giant leaps in health and longevity. This is the Discovery Arc podcast. I'm Drew Duglin, and today let us welcome Dane Goebel. All right, so Dane, what is longevity escape velocity? Ah, uh, longevity escape velocity is uh, it's similar to um, like a Moore's law sort of idea where you see a trend and at a certain point it allows you to, uh, I mean, specifically longevity escape philosophy refers to the amount of um, improvement that you see in health span uh, or lifespan uh, on an annual basis. So that if you were to, for example, um, be able to add a year of your life every year or more than add uh, a year of your life every year, well then at least as far as the math equation goes, then you would have to get hit by a bus in order for you to die. So it's, you know, it's basically that. It's an extraordinarily uh, difficult thing to be able to um, argue for, in my opinion. Um, I think it's more important for folks to focus on certainly not um, incremental improvements, but um, a certain kind of pragmatism where it's like it's an aspirational thing to get to. But um, what's equally as important for, for a variety of reasons is is focusing on the, the reason why you do it in the first place. And the reason why you're doing it in the first place, hopefully, you know, you get to something where it's like, yeah, I know it's an audacious thing that's been accomplished or that you can at least argue that it's been accomplished. But it's just as important for it to be done in a way that's equitable um not just for billionaires and you have to have there are a number of reasons for doing it um but you don't want them to be kind of a solipsistic selfish sort of thing it's it's sure it's about you know celebrating you know your own individual life but far more importantly than that it's about uh you know trying to create the the environment where science can flourish so that you have a reduction a dramatic reduction in suffering in the world and that people have more time to self-actualize every person you know not not just not just the rich you know so for me the hope is that you have a similar sort of impact when you get there as say um like the polio vaccine did where it's like this is something that can impact everyone it's literally it's not it's like this is uh, it's it's addressing something that's uh truly deeply problematic to humankind and that you know is maybe not um for that is very very obvious because it was taking people early in their lives but this is you know aging itself or just a general gradual degradation of human biology is something that uh is you know what you call death by natural causes and it happens to everyone no matter what and in many 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 cases it happens in a very very uh in a not pretty way that's not just painful, but it's psychologically painful for the individual. It's socially isolating. Um, you know, you might have severe cognitive impairment while it's happening. I mean, this is the, you know, it really, really is horrible, you know? And so it, I, I don't know, like, I feel like sometimes people, it's easy to lose sight of that in the, the conversation about, about longevity, you know, and it seems like it's sometimes very much about celebrating youth. And for me, it's, I mean, more so about protecting uh, your loved ones and trying to extend the, the, the viable years of, of, of productivity and actualization for, for every person on the planet. Like I would, I would love to see the average lifespan increase um, dramatically in, in the next decade or so, you know? Yeah. It's amazing what you said there just at the end. It's like when I always think of aging and how it's discussed, it does always seem like the physical ailments as opposed to the social and sort of psychological elements when social community, you know, and a sense of community seems to be one of the best predictors of aging. And I think like that is such a huge thing, especially as we get 
maybe more siloed with um, technology and screens, it's like really easy to forget that. Yeah, exactly. It's weird because it's this, um, it's like this really, really sad sort of selection mechanism that happens. And I think a lot of it ties to, I mean, we're used to the concept that you work your whole life and then, uh, and then you retire and you kind of hang out with your friends and your family. But unfortunately, the reality is, is that, you know, like that's kind of your best case scenario. Um, but even in that scenario, the fact is, is that people's health is dramatically kind of falling off a cliff where, you know, you see, you know, you're pretty good in those middle years. By the time you reach the the area where maybe you feel kind of comfortable in your life, you're becoming just by nature, the fact that the people that you've known your whole life are experiencing more health problems and are passing away or and becoming more, um, they're sidelined to an environment that is centered around managing healthcare. You know, you end up in a place where the job is to sure it's to provide community, um, but you're maybe in a retirement community where really it's it's like a nice version of a hospital. That's like that's not a, that's not the way to live. You know, that's not, and that's certainly not the way that uh, you know, like when you're when you're trying your your best your whole life to be a decent person and and try to do good with your life. It's really depressing to think <laughs> that, that that's kind of how the universe pats you on the back and says, "Hey, great job," you know. Welcome to five years of panic attacks and, and social isolation. And, and it's just like, I, again, I, so I hate to be a kind of a downer at the beginning of this conversation, but I, I don't know. I just think it's, it's really, it's, it's really important because more than anything, I'd say it's literally, it's about trying to kind of like flatten the, the curve a little bit when it comes to adding some sort of, um, social continuity across generations in a lot of ways. Where it's, a, there are these, it would feels like hard lines. And I think it's be, in a way that probably lines closely actually to mortality curves, where it's like you end up isolated simply because there are fewer and fewer people in a given demographic and they simply are, you're not able to communicate with them. And it's, and it's just because there's, there's, there's more of a health stratification almost. And so it's like, if you can slow that process down through whatever, whatever it takes to get there, there's a lot of things that you can can do and people are working on that's kind of the idea so if you're able to slow the the rate at, at which uh, you know health morbidity occurs um, as you get older then you're, you're you know you're able to spend time with your grandparents and it doesn't feel like an act of charity it feels like something this is a person that's that's thriving and they're able to impart wisdom to you in a in a highly cogent and tapped in sort of way you know, because that's the that's the hardest thing is that I think like um, people who get into that, you know, as you as you age, when you get into that situation, they it's they are not happy that they feel like they can't contribute as much as they did when they were, when they were younger. You know, they they feel it, and and everybody feels it. And it's and it's really sad because they're amazing people. They are not any different than anybody else. It's just they they've been they've been in the trenches their whole life and there's, you know, they're kind of beaten down. Life takes a toll, you know? So I hope that we can get to a point, hopefully soonish, um, where you, you're really starting to see that the, the, the people who are of a certain chronological age, you know, are, are able to be just as, if not more, um, impactful in, in, in the world as the folks who happen to have, you know, youthful vigor. How close do you think we are to that? It's a really, that's such a great question. It's very, very difficult to say. And I think a lot of it comes down to um, the technology. It, it comes down to, uh, on what your measuring stick is. So I think that um, I'm pretty confident that actually by the end of the decade, at least for a small subset of uh, probably the very wealthy, we'll be able to argue that it's uh, as a proof of principle, you know, really, or a proof of concept that it actually can be done. You might be able to get pretty close to having a you know, pretty flat aging rate. Like it might be able to be slowed dramatically, dramatically, but that's going to take um, a lot of different uh, approaches kind of stack on top of each other, you know? So that's going to be probably, you know, gene and cell therapy and, you know, um, probably some, uh, some replacement, uh, methodologies, tissue replacement. also, you know, maybe some immune phoresis. I mean, there's a lot of different things that are probably going to end up going into, you know, some sort of protocol that's going to get them there. Um, you know, aside from just using common sense and exercising and getting sleep and all that sort of stuff. Um, but what's, what's more important is 
how do we make sure that as that's happening, um, we we set a strong foundation for um, regulatory adoption and that things are being done in such a way so that they um, will be able to scale uh, economically, right? So that, and, and a lot of that is like, we have to be able to argue that not only can these things um, get cheaper, but that um, governments need to be thinking ahead uh, and actively supporting those sorts of approaches um, in order to both be competitive at a, at a global scale, because just simply extending the productivity time of, you know, of your population is you know probably a good idea. But we have to make sure that the, the treatments that are there are something that's available for, for the general public as quickly as possible. And so that, I guess that's another way of saying like, you know, you're going to have a lot of therapies um, that come out. You need to have more competition in order for the prices to go down for those different treatments. You need SAS regulatory adoption um, and you need, uh, and so the other, the other piece of it is like you need biomarkers. And so we do a lot of work around, around biomarkers. It's um, something that I think the field has been looking for, for, I mean, pretty much since its infancy. And thankfully now, uh, especially um, the molecular markers are getting to the point where I think, you know, you'll be able to argue very, very, very soon that a constellation of molecular biomarkers, you know, um, you know, be it methylation and uh, proteomics and metabolomics and all, all sorts of stuff are probably going to be put together in a um, with maybe different models that are going to be predictive of, uh, of mortality and morbidity. And then uh, we have to figure out how to get the price down for it. So you say, however many hundreds of markers or 20 markers or however, maybe, I don't know, who knows? We don't know. But when we figure out what those high signal markers are, then we have to figure out how to get it down to like $50 a pop. And so that would be some boring thing that you get, you know, every time you get your physical. And those are going to be the markers that are going to be, you know, what you call, you know, biomarkers of aging. Um, but in a way, what they are is they're going to show you know, pre pre pathology conditions of your organs and your various systems. And you're saying like, hey, you have this, these collection of markers that are kind of out of field for what you'd want them to be given your age. Okay, well, we can start to treat those similar to how, you know, you would treat somebody who isn't diabetic yet, but is starting to show, you know, signs of pre-diabetes, you know, that kind of thing. And so a lot of, I think what we, what we're going to end up needing is just like, a lot of it's like, it's just radically preventative medicine. And, but you need to have a structure in place for that to happen. If you don't, if you don't have that, then it really will be something that for probably a little while is going to really only be available for, for the rich. And you need to be able to have something that you can, is accepted by the FDA and they say, yes, this is uh, whatever they decide to label it, label it, whether they call it a gerotherapeutic or not, but it's something that's going to be like, yes, this is a preventative medicine. You can take some sort of prescription as a prophylactic um, uh, or something that says, no, what it is, is it's treating the, an accelerated aging element in one of one or, you know, more, more than one of your organs, which is then going to drag your system down and increase your likelihood of, of pathology showing up. Yeah, a few years down the road, something like that. Yeah. I really like that perspective of, you know, we, we have a public need almost to keep people healthy, to keep us competitive, you know, on the economic front uh, as a country, which is not really something people talk about. So that was interesting. And I do want to get to some of those approaches. You mentioned biomarkers, but excited to dig into those other ones. But um, maybe before that, I mean, how did we even get here? Like, what is your past interest in health and aging you know how did you grow up what was your sort of passion for for science in this space i know you mentioned your, your father before so tell me about that yeah so i mean it um let's see it's a it's a tough one uh because i mean for my for myself i mean the, the field was around obviously before before we were but it was i would say that it was probably a little bit more focused on um ger gerontology which in a lot of cases was focused more on care um, and, you know, kind of mitigation sorts of approaches and that kind of thing. Um, it was less on the, Hey, wouldn't it be kind of nuts if you could actually, you know, hack these kind of upstream processes and actually slow down the rate of aging. That was kind of when we, when we first got involved in it, that was a pretty insane idea that if you were a scientist, who was going to say like, no, I actually think it's possible. And maybe here's a few ways that we could give it a try. Like you get left out of the room. So. Um, so when we first got started, a lot of what the, uh, the, the goal was, was just simply legitimizing people saying publicly that it's an okay thing to think about. 
that like it doesn't have to be a, a wild and crazy notion it's just saying like the same thing as maybe you can cure cancer maybe you can you know like it's like oh no this is you can define aging you can say that this is something that can be understood there's a long way to go but there's a collection of different things that are working together to um yeah to make you fall apart over time but defining those things and then trying to figure out how to to create an approach that's going to let you do something both scientifically but also just simply having it be an okay thing to say out loud was was really important in terms of the why of it i mean i can run you through just really really quickly i think so my, my dad and i started the the very earliest version of it when i was 15 and when we first got started it wasn't specifically around aging um it was um a, a a frustration with just the healthcare system in general and kind of a, a frustration with the, the what felt like kind of incrementalism um, versus, hey, let's try to do something audacious and see what we can do about it. And so we were really, really interested in open innovation. This was like right around the same time that XPRIZE was really getting going. And so we were, we were inspired by um, the Longitude Prize and Food Preservation Prize and the Ortigue Prize and all of these things that, you know, really galvanized, uh, you know, some sort of, you know, scientific or engineering community to do something that uh, was really, really audacious. And so what we originally wanted to do was to do, um, you know, challenges, uh, open innovation challenges around around healthcare. It was as simple as that. It was kind of broad. We originally were going to um, focus on heart disease um, because it was, you know, probably the number one thing that would kill you if nothing else did. And then um, a few years later, I think uh, my dad was, uh, he was on uh, was an online forum. I think it was like Extropian or something like that. Um, and uh, he met Aubrey, uh, Aubrey de Grey. And so that was kind of, that was, I think, maybe the thing that was like, oh, okay, actually aging is, is central to basically, you know, all the things that are going to kill you if, you know, a bus doesn't um, or some other disease doesn't. And so that, it seemed like, um, and I wish he was here because he could probably tell us better than I could. Um I mean, that was really the, the idea is it was like, oh, okay, well, if you're going to try to make a dent on something, okay, let's, let's do the thing that's touching all, all of the problems. Like that's just the core central thing, which then turns into a variety of different morbidities. And so, okay, like that's, that's the audacious thing to aim at because it forces you to define new things. It forces you to uh, create a community. It's sufficiently audacious. Like it's a really hard problem. But it's um, but it is still something that yeah, there's enough known about it where um, you 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 can you know do some targeted um, innovation development. You can say okay, well we can set some criteria for what would work and or what we consider to be success and what we don't. And so um, in 2003, um, we launched um, the Methuselah Mouse Prize, which was really there to um, provide some sort of um, uh, proof um, positive. Um, kind of evidence that uh, caloric restriction in particular was effective uh, for extending the lifespan of mice. And so they were able to significantly extend the lifespan of mice um, by using by using uh, just simple caloric restriction. And so that to us was like a way of saying, hey, this is something that you can do. Now, like not everyone on the planet needs to starve, them, starve themselves. Like it's probably not super sustainable, but a balanced version of this is actually like, this is a good idea. And what it's doing is it's not just a, it's not just a diet. Like it's literally is actually changing the way your metabolism works. It is actually making you, you know, live longer. After we got the import, the Methuselah mouse prize going, Aubrey wanted to do, um, sense the strategies for engineered negligible senescence. So nice acronym, if that's hard to say. And, uh, you wanted to do a research institution. And so, um, I mean, it, it made sense that, uh, yeah, at the time to take SENS and spin it out into its own research institution. And so they've been doing that now for, well, yeah, since 2008, uh, 2009, I think is when they officially spun out. So they have a great intramural research program. They do research on aging, similar to how the buck does research on aging. Um, it's really fantastic. And uh, we got to focus um, on doing more innovation challenges and um, more, um, you know, we put together a pretty substantial investment program. So we we kind of felt like um, our, more of our interest is in putting together um, programs and um, uh, that that encourage all sorts of folks to to come to the table and do the work versus you know running a running a research institution. So it, it kind of enabled us to. You know, for SINs to do their thing, which they're great at, and 
for us to focus more on staying lean and, and putting programs out there that are supportive of, of a variety of uh, different approaches it allows us to feel more opportunistic um, and less like this is just our research period. Yeah. Yeah, I felt for so long that so much of the medical system is set up around um, symptomology once disease is already in place. So it must be so interesting for you from such a young age to have maybe seen some more of that evolution around, well, shouldn't we actually try and prevent disease in the first place? You know, <laughs> diagnostics, things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's been incredibly cool over the years to see the field mature from something like that's just like completely ephemeral, uh, almost entirely to, to like, yeah, no, we've, we've, there are a number of companies now that are in clinical trials or approaching clinical trials, and they are really, really uh, cool platform technologies that some of which do not even seem to be like aging specific, but they are doing things that absolutely are going to dramatically extend lifespan. Um, and so it's, it's been really, really amazing to see that, you know, both, you know, the, the companies that you'd expect, you know, like Cytolytic kind of companies to, to things that are, um, you know, doing more tissue sort of oriented approaches, like tissue rejuvenation and replacement approaches. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of, uh, there's really a lot of cool companies that are coming out of it. I, I kind of hope that, and I kind of feel that it's like the, the first wave, you know, of like punk rock or something like that, where it's like, these are the, like, you know, it's like, this is the, these are going to be the companies that people look back and are like, holy moly, like that was, that was wild. It came out of nowhere. And it's like, actually they came out of, you know, 20 years of, of being frustrated with, uh, the, the status quo of, of, you know, science, um, uh, and biotech. And they're like, no, we're going to try to do something that's a little bit more audacious. And so they're, they're doing it. Um, and thank God. <laughs> so yeah. hopefully, hopefully, uh, in, in a few years, you know, the, you know, stuff is going to be coming to market if maybe, maybe even sooner, who knows, but it really is going to be, it's going to be an amazing time. Yeah. To become an overnight success takes at least 10 years. I think. So. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. A lot of sweat, a lot of, a lot of stress, you know? Yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the, the doctrine of the Methuselah Foundation that I see is is to you know the audacious goal of to make ninety the new new fifty. So yeah, what are some of the ways that maybe seem most likely, and some of the the things that you're kind of most excited about in terms of projects and different organ systems and things like that? Yeah, uh, let's see. Well, it takes like it takes a lot, and again, it's you know the defining ninety and defining what fifty is 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 honestly still even something that we're trying to to figure out. So we started working with um, a group that uh, is fiscally sponsored by Methuselah called the Biomarkers of Aging Consortium, which was you know first started um, by Madi Mokri and Jesse Paganik and Daniel Gladyshev. Um, you know, most mostly folks from the Gladyshev lab at Harvard. Um, and they put together an amazing group of, of scientists to work on thought leadership uh, in this space to actually say, okay, like, this is what we know, this is how we can define, um, you know, what a validated biomarker of aging would actually be. And so a lot of uh, the work that I've been doing lately is to try to help support, um, you know, that effort, because if we don't, if we don't have biomarkers, then we can't say that 90 is the new 50 ever. Like we, we only have functional biomarkers, which are okay. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with them, but they're not going to be perhaps as useful as we would like them to be. If you're going, if you're trying to do preventative medicine, so you can improve somebody's grip strength and gait length and VO2 max and all those things. And that is, that is fantastic for probably from a, like a translational, uh, for a clinical perspective, those things are going to be super useful to be able to like at a glance, understand if something is making an improvement or not. But we also want to make sure that, um, you, you know, we're able to do this preventatively. You know, you can't really, I don't think there's going to be a, a great way of doing this preventatively unless you have a constellation of high signal biomarkers, molecular biomarkers. That's going to, that can say like, yeah, one of your organs is aging, aging faster than the others or, or something like that. So, so the first thing is to really um, define in a predictive way what the heck we mean by 90 and what the heck we mean by 50. And then in terms of the actual stuff that I think is cool, there's a, there's a number of really fantastic companies uh, in this space, some of which we've invested in, a lot of which we haven't for, because maybe we didn't have enough money in the bank at the time, but we wish we could have. And they run the gamut from, from everything from, uh, from like small molecule senolytics stuff that's there to um, basically if you have zombie cells, senescent cells that are 
messing up uh, your body that are messing up all sorts of different things. This is these are uh, these can go in and and basically cause them to to die. They say these cells. They are ready to go. Uh, they're not helping. These cells should have already died a long, long time ago. Um, and that's kind of what they do. They go through and they, they kind of get rid of the stuff that's drawing resources or confusing other cells. Uh, yeah, and so there's that. Um, then, let's see, gosh, there's, there's so many. Um, then there's, um, you know, partial cellular reprogramming, which literally is kind of uh, it's taking your cells. It's literally kind of like reversing time on your cells is taking them uh, back in time uh, to being younger um, but before they go pluripotent so before they uh, they de-differentiate into you know just like a regular stem cell it's able to kind of go back but but stop it before it gets too young and weird things start happening um, so Turn Turn Bio is an amazing company in that space that we've worked with for a really long time, and they've got cool cool things in the mix uh, that are, will be happening pretty soon. There's also uh, let's see, there's a cool company called Mitrix that um, has a mitochondrial bioreactor. So they they do um, mitochondri mitochondrial transplants, but they do it um, through um, uh, autologous. Uh, cells, right? So these are your own cells. This is coming from another donor, but they take your cells and then they, you know, do some exciting things with them. They end up in a bioreactor. They proliferate. They create a whole bunch of more uh, white, white mitochondria, and then they they transplant it into you. And mitochondria is, you know, the 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 power plant of your cells. And so if you're looking for something that's maybe going to have some surprisingly potent um, systemic effects, that's a very interesting approach. Uh, another company that we've worked with uh, is Nanotics. It's really, really cool. They, um, they do, you know, uh, immune phoresis. So I, I kind of think about it as um, kind of like a spam filter for your immune system. And so a, a lot of, uh, you know, certainly this, this ties into aging as you age, but just in general, there's a variety of things that can throw off the signaling um, that happens um, uh, with the, the proteins that are kind of bouncing around in your bloodstream. And so, for example, when you have a tumor, um, it puts out chemical uh, signals that say, hey, protect me, protect me, protect me. Um, zombie senescent cells do the same thing. Uh, but tumors just do it extremely potently and very, very loudly and effectively. And so um, your immune system just can't tell that there's something bad going on there because you just, they're, they're bombarded with protect me signals. And, I, and funny enough, there's a lot of cancer drugs that when you try to put them into a cell, this cell then sends out more of those protect me, protect me uh, signals. And so they're, I mean, they work, but they're not that effective, not nearly as effective because what they end up doing is they create more spam. Uh, at the same time as they're they're trying to they're trying to do something, um, so I love uh, I love Nanotex Tech because what it does is um, it basically bounces off the cell membrane. It doesn't do anything inside the cell. It bounces off and it just uh, depletes the improper signaling. It basically just goes through and like a sponge and just cleans up the stuff uh, that it doesn't that isn't needed, right? And so it makes it so that. Um, you know, tumors can be ablated very, very, very effectively, but without having any impact on your immune system, right? Which is pretty crazy when you think about it. It can also handle things like cytokine storms. So everybody found out about what a cytokine storm was when, you know, when COVID hit, but, you know, long before that, right, you have sepsis and that kills a lot of people. And that's caused by your body going into a state of freak out. And it just says, hey, like, we're going to create some, some wild inflammation. Um, but this can go through and it's able to remove those signals. and so looks like it could be able to treat, sep treat sepsis aside from things like chronic inflammation or what they call it like inflammaging you know that happens as you get older there's a lot of there's like a yak for probably another half hour so i should i should probably stop that but there's there's also some others that are um like extherma that is that does organ uh, tissue preservation which is incredibly important if you're starting to think about like replacement methodologies where if you're not talking necessarily whole organ replacement, maybe you're talking about implanting a part of a, a young engineered organ into an older organ, which could, you know, biologically reverse age in that organ, perhaps. Um, or maybe you are talking about whole organ replacement. And that's obviously, you know, not just for for people who are in the, you know, the geroscience or like the longevity oriented community, but that's, you know, that's solving the tissue or the, uh, the transplant waiting list problem. There's like so many people who are waiting for, for transplants. Um, and even then when you get them, you have to have, 
you know, immune suppressing drugs like the rest of your life. So like you want to be able to have bioengineered organs from your own stem cells eventually, that sure would be nice. But until then, if nothing else, you need to be able to increase the, the supply um, so that people don't have to wait so long. And then by the time that they get what they need, you know, everything is gone completely sideways. Yeah, so it's, it's kind of an interesting thing to talk about because there's a lot of things that aren't, they're not labeled as aging, but really what they are are platform technologies that are really trying to hack at the roots of what, of, of the problems. Yeah. When I was, oh, must have been 15, 16 at secondary school. I remember watching this documentary. I still remember it. That was when I first found out about this idea of bioengineering organs and having them just grow in like a matrix and like printing all these new organs that could be used. And I had this sense that it was like just around the corner. And then I'm just, and now I'm just like, well, damn, it's still not here. Like what, it seems like there's been a lot of challenges with this and, you know, I don't know how close we are now to, to having this, but God, that would be so, so impactful. Yeah. And, and thankfully, um, it seems like more funding is coming into the area. Like ARPH announced a pretty chunky 3D bioprinting, um, program, which is nice. And there's, you know, there's some other things that are happening where it looks like Welcome Leap has one that's like that. That's from the Welcome Trust out of the UK. That's a good chunk of funding. Um, there's more funding that's coming in. The technology is more competent, competent than it was before. It seems, I don't know. It seems like things are shaping up where you'll hopefully have, you know, good news in the next you know few years, I guess you can say. The good news, especially with the transplant stuff, is that like, it's, it is not something that you can ever argue as uh, uh, some sort of elective kind of thing. It's like, no, if your liver is toast, you, you're going to get on the waiting list. And as soon as something is there that, you know, is legit. Like that you have to give it to you. So that one is probably going to move faster regulatory wise than a lot of the other things in some ways. Yeah. And actually on that front with the speed of progress, what was uh, organs on a microchip? Oh um, yeah. So we've been working on a program for the last couple of years. I think, I mean, anytime you, you try to do something new, it's a little bit tricky sometimes to find your feet exactly the right, the right thing to poke at. But let's see here. Um, we're big fans of tissue chips, and really, tissue chips are useful for mod for modeling different things, right? So the idea is eventually you want to get to the point of having a proper digital human being. You know, you want to be able to do you know in silico drug development that is going to be highly predictive of efficacy. Right? You need to be able to develop drugs or treatments that aren't just going to be safe, but that they're going to be very effective so that you can um, reduce the cost of uh, and the risk of, of clinical trials. Right? So that's, that's really the big problem is that it's way too hard to make a drug and then actually get into humans. It costs way too much money. It costs way too much time. The failure rate's crazy high. Uh, and also, you have to kill a whole bunch of animals along the way, which is not so nice. Uh, and also, in a, a lot of cases, kind of a waste of time because animal biology is not the same, you know, as human biology. There's some things that are very similar and then other things that aren't. And sometimes you get surprised when you go on a trial and it's a mess. And so the idea, um, and this is not an idea that's, you know, certainly not, and I, you know, we didn't come up with this set, come up with this idea. This is uh, amazing work that was um, pioneered at the Wies Institute years ago now, I guess maybe a decade, maybe a little bit longer than that. I, even, I can't even remember exactly, but the idea is that you want to be able to create models, in vitro models of human biology that you can then develop and test drugs on. And the higher fidelity um, those models are, and the more I, uh, I guess integrative those are, um, the better the better that you're going to do it trying to uh, recapitulate um, a human uh, in vitro. So what you really want is something like a whole bunch of um, tissue chips uh, linked up that are uh, multi-organ, right? So they're representative of. Every organ that you can think of, uh, including your brain uh, or certain parts of your brain uh, and each, you know, sub organ, all the things, the more that you can do it and have them all talk to each other is, you know, you hopefully get to the point that you have, you know, what you would call like a human avatar or a human bio avatar. And once you have a system like that, where you have, you have a series of tissue chips, which are running daisy chained or in parallel, but in any way, like hopefully representing the way that the organs actually work together to, to do stuff. You know, you have the standards that both uh, the data standards, the f like literal physical interoperability standards, similar to what you would think of when it comes to like USB, 
you know, or something like that, where you can just plug it into your computer and it works. This is kind of what you want with that. Like you want to have a heart chip that could talk to the lung chip, which can talk to the intestine chip, which can talk to the, right. And all of these things, you know, are, are able to interoperate and they're able to, you know, data can flow from one thing to the next thing. Um, you know, you're talking about microfluidics, like you're having cells flow from one thing to the next, that actual, actual stuff is happening. The cool thing with one of the cool things with tissue chips is that because they're transparent, you know, it's very, very easy um, to visualize them or, you know, from like you can take pictures of them and you can, you know, you can see how things are flowing and what rate it flows and that sort of stuff. So if you have a really good in vitro model um, for a human, um, a multi-organ uh, in vitro model, it's just a couple of steps away to being able to do it in silico. Because you've got all the data, you can see what's happening. You know, when you can get to the point, I'm sorry, I'm kind of rambling, but it's, it's, it's really cool. When you get to the point where you have a, like a, say, like a, a specific individual, let's say you do a bunch of testing on them, you get a, like an, a, a multi-omic profile of, uh, of what that individual kind of is, the way that they respond to, to different drugs, the way that they, you know, you know, right? Um, and you can have a, um, a multi-organ model that behaves just like they do, you should be able to test a, a drug on them to figure out if it's going to be safe and effective. What you've described here, there are many crazy ideas and I'm sure some more viable than others. So just on the foundation front, you know, say I'm a health and longevity researcher, what are the things you and the foundation sort of look for when it comes to research investment in this kind of space? Oh, okay. Well, what do we look for? Um, we, we, um, well, the first, the first goal is, uh, is impact, right? So if we're going to fund something, we have to feel like, um, part of it is that we're the right person to fund it. Right. And so, um, in, you know, we don't have an insane amount of, uh, of money, of money. We would like to have a lot more cause it, we'd be able to fund a lot more stuff, but if nothing else, you know, um, we can help people find other folks to, to fund the things. Uh, and so our, our effort, both in terms of like, you know, I don't know how to put this exactly, but you know, we, we see like the impact is both like either us funding it or finding a funder or, you know, doing some sort of syndication that allows for good stuff to, to get funded. But in terms of what we look for, um, you know, we, we look for stuff that's kind of aligned to specific interests, um, that are, you know, like I mentioned before, if it's cellulitics, some sort of, uh, there's a variety of different therapies that you can have, something in the replacement area. We're pretty open-minded about the, the actual approaches themselves. We don't spend as much time in the diagnostic space. Um, I, I feel like a lot of what we're doing is we're looking for stuff that is, um, hard. It, that's both, uh, technologically very, very impressive and interesting and hopefully, uh, a platform. Um, but also is probably something that is not getting enough funding or attention as it should. You know, we, you know, when we invest in something, the hope is that it's a signal to other investors and say, oh, this is like, these guys are willing to invest in things that are not necessarily, you know, we, we tend to, we like to be like the first check. If it's like, hey, this is something that's really, really interesting. Uh, if we think it's going to make a big impact, if it succeeds, um, and we're not in, we're not in, interested in making, you know, a hundred bets on, you know, to, to de-risk, you know, things we're, we're interested in being very, very careful and picking like just a few things that we think are really, they're really, really, really interesting. They have something that's, that's different than, than what other people are doing. Like you want something that's almost a little weird, something that's, that feels elegant, something that feels like, wow, that's actually it's not just some sort of incremental improvement on some area that other people are already exploring. You kind of like want it to be almost like the first company in the space. And then, you know, three years down the road, they have like a gazillion competitors, but that field itself or that, that subset of the industry might not have actually happened if it wasn't for those first initial investments being made. Um, generally it's going to be a breakthrough from some lab somewhere that nobody expected. Um, or it's going to be some really just brilliant platform that's, that's approaching things in like a different way. And so if, if it's something that is hard for other investors to understand, we're probably going to be more interested <laughs> in it actually. <laughs> no, I love it. It's, it makes sense. It's like looking for those trailblazers that kind of create the new category. It's going to pull yeah. the whole industry forward and then with it, the, the human impact. 
That's much better, but <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, and, and so I was looking at your bio, your bio and uh, you sort of talk about life extension on Earth and beyond. So are there links here as well in your interest to, uh, yeah, extraterrestrial projects? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I love, um, we, so we've, when we were working on, um, on the tissue bioengineering um, side of things, uh, we had originally put together a challenge that was on whole whole organ bioengineering, but in the course of trying to get it off the ground, we realized it was uh, about a decade, probably too early. Um, but in the course of doing that, we we did realize that hey, some really good impact could be made on certain specific bottlenecks in you know in that tech tree. Uh, and so we started working um, with NASA on a microvasculature uh, oriented challenge, and so. Um, the relationship with space really kind of came from that when, and realizing that, you know, there's a lot of things that are really, really great about space when it comes to trying to solve hard problems before they're, um, acutely, uh, risky. So, um, a lot of folks won't, um, you know, fund, uh, aging related research or, you know, geroscience, because they feel like it's too it's too nascent or too risky or or whatever. Uh, in microgravity, you are experiencing what looks a heck of a lot like accelerated aging. So from an inflammatory perspective, it's not just like Bowden density, which would be the obvious thing, but it's also from an inflammatory perspective. It, I mean, everything like just starts getting really really wonky, and it looks like you're you're aging very very rapidly. So. Um, you know, there's, I think there's two folks who have been in space or have been in uh, the ISS now for, not right now, but like a few years back, you know, uh, Scott Kelly had been up there for a year. And then I want to say it was like a year, a year and change ago, um, there was a Russian astronaut who, who crossed over a year. But the health outcomes were not fantastic for this, you know. So Scott Kelly lost 30% of his heart volume. Like, that's really, really crazy. You know, so they call it transient aging because you can come back to Earth and then, you know, things more or less, they sort themselves out, which is nice. Nobody's really been up there long enough to figure out how bad it can get, uh, if that makes sense. Um, but the effects of being in space are very, 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 very bad for you. It's not a good place to be. It's fun for a week, but then you should probably come home. And so, um, I, I yeah, we like, we like space for that reason because it creates, it makes aging like an acute problem. Um, and of course, you know, if you're, if you're NASA or you're a private space company, your, uh, your astronauts are, they're like single points of failure. They're very, very high value assets. You have to keep them very healthy. You have to keep them productive because like every minute you're up there is insanely expensive, you know? And so, um, it, you know, on earth you might go like, oh, it's okay. Aging is just one of those things. And, you know, 50 years from now, it might be a problem, but so what, it's a problem to everybody. You know, up, up there though, like you're, you're talking about something that's, um, you yeah, know, super risky. Like it really makes a huge impact. And so the hope is that, you know, we can get to the point where, you know, maybe you're doing drug um, development specifically for, you know, maybe a given astronaut um, and you can test it out in space on a, you know, a multi-organ tissue chip that is tuned to that specific individual. So you can test out whether some sort of like vanilla understood therapeutic is going to have the effect that you wanted to, to mitigate the effects of accelerated aging in space, AKA basically does it, is this drug going to slow down time kind of sort of for this astronaut, except for them, they're aging much, much, much faster or a quote unquote aging much, 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 much faster. And so you're going to be able to see a, you know, a, a, a positive result you know, much quicker. So I don't know, like that's kind of a long winded way of, uh, of, of saying that, but that's kind of the, the hope. It creates a perfect experimental environment for, uh, for testing gerotherapeutics. Do you think we're going to be living on Mars then? And what's the aging going to be like? <laughs> oh, I have no idea. Uh, I think it's possible. I couldn't, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I know that like the hope is that, you know, you start seeing some interesting stuff push in that direction in the next, you know, the, the following decade from now. You know, but I think like anything else, it'll be very, very small groups of folks like, a you know, outpost on, a, on Antarctica, you know, but the, um, yeah, so microgravity is, uh, you know, you, you, it's not going to be as bad on Mars. I'm sure the less atmosphere you have, the more radiation problems you have, of course. Um, mm. but Mars will be better than the moon and the moon will be, be better than being in the ISS. You know, the more that you have, you know, one G probably the better. But I don't think anybody really knows yet. So the hope is that you can have 
a um, you know a terrestrial uh, test bed that allows you to um, recapitulate different uh, or you know variable microgravity levels so that you can anticipate what's going to happen when you go to that environment. So you can have let's say you make some tissue chips of an astronaut, you validate them in you know in microgravity uh, in the ISS. You're like, okay, this is going to work. Okay, well let's uh, let's hope. And then and then you can tune. Tune it to 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 Earth uh, to to lunar gravity, then to Martian gravity, and you just you hope that everything's going to work out when they when they get there. How have you been thinking about sort of the role now of AI and robotics in sort of our future and extension of life and possible merging and other technologies? Yeah, I mean, I think for for now the biggest interest is in creating better predictive models uh, of outcomes. So there's a huge amount of data that's out there and uh, it needs to get harmonized and it needs to be, you know, you need to have correlation between digital biomarkers to blood-based biomarkers and other functional biomarkers and to molecular biomarkers. Um, the hope is that, you know, eventually you end up with a model that's able to passively um, track what you're doing throughout the day um, and have it be predictive of what's going on molecularly, which is then in turn predictive of, uh, of future morbidity and uh, you know and life expectancy, um, because if you're able to do that, then you're you're going to be able to intervene earlier in people's lives. So yeah. Um, so to me, that's that's the, the that's just me personally. That's the only that's the, the main thing that um, that we're focused on. But obviously, AI is becoming incredibly helpful when it comes to drug discovery. Um, incredibly helpful. Um, and if you're talking like wild and crazy stuff, I mean, I, the next few years are going to be wildly interesting, <laughs> you know, <laughs> to say, to say well, the, already that. Yes, you know what I mean? Like it's already, it's, we're already, you know, at warp speed right now. So I, you know, your guess is as good as mine, you know, which sci-fi book we end up in, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, but I, I, you know, from the time I was a kid, I always, would think about you know ancestor simulations and things like that and you know how how many you know how many levels down are we you know and things like that and it's fun to think about and hopefully not have it keep you up at night but i mean the, the bigger thing for me i guess would be you know things like data sovereignty or having some sort of version of that i think and i think from a healthcare perspective that's actually Maybe um, yeah, with a little bit of luck, I'd love for someone to do it um, for people to really be able to own all of their healthcare data um, because it's going to be so uh, the, the predictive qu qualities that it have is going to be, you know, so valuable. And I mean, like, it's just the data is just out there. Uh, and it's it's weird because it's simultaneously it's so easy to get if you're the the right group and also impossible to get for the folks that really need it um i would love to see um a world where um clinicians and large healthcare systems and insurance companies and you know everybody who has some sort of access to to healthcare data uh, is able to share it more freely or to generate like synthetic data from from that data which then can be used by researchers to you know, create um, therapeutics and that sort of stuff. Um, I also think it's really important for, you know, you as an individual to own the data that you produce for folks. It's just very, so far has been very, very difficult for there to be a good system for that, you know? And I, a lot of people have good ideas. I I wish I knew the, the right way to do it from a um, consumer perspective, you know? Yeah, we've started to really champion this idea of synthetic data sets to sort of protect that patient data and when yeah when you're talking about what was you know ai enhanced drug discovery that's going to be tested on organ microchips microgravity <laughs> this is a sci-fi novel I, you know the governance <laughs> and ethics you know really needs to come along with it so it's uh it's yeah gonna be hard but i really i really hope that i mean i think the the thing is to do probably is to start with the biobanks um because they have a relatively small number of of actual decision makers there and so if you can produce a, like a, a good good proposal that enables and they're scientifically oriented like that their goal is to actually provide things to to researchers they want that to happen if but if there's a way for you to, you know to come up with a, a schema that legally you know based on the country that they're in legally allows for there to be utility from the data if not the data itself 
then it shouldn't be that hard to get folks to uh, to get on board. You know, like UK Biobank has done an incredible job. There's other biobanks that are trying to do things that are like that, and I hope they do. I just, I'd love to see that. And I think probably before that, though, like having, um, you know, just having data standards that makes it easy to harmonize the data once it's there. You know, you can say, we we under at least understand the data that you have, and we we, we can work with it so that it, you can play nice with somebody else's data set, you know? Having those standards in place is going to make it a lot easier to hopefully get that ball rolling. Yeah, absolutely. Need to see more of that. Uh, Dane, I have a uh, final tradition on the podcast, my final roundup question, which, you know, if you could give your one piece of advice, piece of wisdom in the area of work, productivity, health, growth, relationships, whatever it is, what do you think it would be and why? Um, uh, I guess, um, yeah, I, I don't know, like openness, maybe. You know, if you're, um, I mean, it's weird to be on a podcast and just, and just say something like you should try to try your best to listen because I've just been yakking nonstop now for an hour. But I mean, I think that's um, so much of what life is, is less about trying to force um, some sort of goal. You know, if you can have a broad thing that you want at the end and that's, that's going to still be your, you know, that's the lighthouse that you're using to help you navigate for sure. But it wouldn't. What most of it really is, is it's, you know, it's, it's an alignment exercise. It's finding the right people that you can get work done with. And if you, um, if you don't cultivate a, uh, an open, um, caring sort of empathetic and curious environment, it's going to be really, really hard to find, um, the people that are going to, that are going to carry you there. So it's like. I don't know if nothing else, it's like, try to care a lot about the people that you work with and the people that are in your life. Cause they're the only ones that are, those are the people, you know, those are you. There's this cool book. Uh, you ever read Cat's Creole? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I read it last year. Uh, yeah. Well, so like, Mom, yeah. <laughs> also I love, I love, uh, the concept of the caress in, in their, in the fake religion called Bokanonism. Um, my soul to your soul. Um, but I, to me, it's like this thing. What, what the idea is like a caress is like it's a group of spiritual warriors who are drawn together to accomplish some goal, and they don't really know how it happened to them. And I think, I, I mean, it's a hilarious book, but I think there's there's like a lot of truth to that. And it's like you don't know who in the world is going to end up in your boat, and uh, you just have to really be grateful. And uh, yeah, super grateful when someone shows up in your boat, and you're like, well, I guess we're on an adventure together. You know, you just got to really try to take care of each other. Yeah, that is a beautiful thing. You find those connections that you never anticipated, and then you're doing great things together. Yeah. That was fantastic. I, I really appreciate you being here. I love what the, the foundation is doing, and you're really at the cutting edge of so many uh, interesting things. So I'm glad after all those years when you weren't sure and, and people were sort of naysaying, I'm glad you, you folks stuck with it and sort of pushed forward. Thank you. Yeah, it's uh, it's a huge honor and responsibility, and I'm just so glad that there's um, such an incredible um, community of people who have their hearts totally focused on on the mission. It's really an amazing group of people, and uh, well, and, you, and I love you guys. You know, Sage is awesome. Uh, when I met uh, Luca, oh gosh, I don't know, three or four months ago or something like that, I was like, hey man, this is a good guy. And usually, if you're a good guy at the you know needing something, you have a you have you have a good company and you have good good people. Or, you know, focus on the mission, you know, and so it's, it's always nice for me to meet someone like that. Yeah, yeah, we're definitely focused on that great mission and, and thrilled to have you as a as a partner. So uh, where should people go if they want to know more about uh, Foundation, about yourself? Oh, sure. I mean, they can go to um, mfoundation.org. Uh, um, it's in the, you know, in the midst of doing a little bit of a brand refresh, so burden our dust. Um, and then um, agingconsortium.org. If they're looking to uh, to learn about aging biomarkers, and we have um, we have a challenge that's going on right now on your platform, so you can go to if they're like a data scientist, they can go to Synapse uh, Synapse.org/biomarkers, and then um, yeah, we've got a challenge that's going to be running. Uh, we have about another month in the first phase of the challenge, which is using is around using um, DNA methylation data to predict chronological age. Um, but we have another, we have a second phase coming up, uh, in, um, in July, uh, in July, which is around, uh, mortality prediction. And for that, we will also have a couple of really cool, um, targeted proteomic, um, data sets that will be included. 
Uh, and then next year, we'll have a really, really cool challenge around predicting um, mor morbidity using a yeah, very, very uh, cool multi-omic data set, which will probably include metabolomics and untargeted proteomics and glycomics and all sorts of other things that end in omics. So, yeah, exciting time. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to see where everything goes. So thank you for all you do. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much, Drew. It was great meeting you.